Hello, welcome to Swiss Watch Game. Welcome to a very special interview. Today we're here in Lausanne with Pierre Biver. Pierre, thank you for welcoming us in your beautiful home. It's nice to see you again. Very happy to have you here. Happy that you made it safely from Zurich uh, to Lausanne. <laughs> It was a wild ride, yeah. This <laughs> is a wild ride, I, I can imagine. It's a, it's nice to have you here. It's nice to be able to to talk a bit about watches. For those who don't know him, go check out his Instagram account. He showcases very cool watches. Definitely a nice variety. And the name might sound familiar to you. He's got watchmaking running through his veins. His father is the famous Jean-Claude Biver. And definitely you can see the passion for watch collecting in, in on this table as well. So before we dive into this, uh, let's do a quick wrist check. What are you wearing? Uh, so today I, I took out the save this uh, RM double two in rose gold. A very uh, uh, discreet watch. Very discreet watch <laughs> uh, with a nice green strap. Yes, which doesn't uh, stick out at all. <laughs> I think you wouldn't expect it. You wouldn't expect that combo to look so good, but yeah, it's it, awesome. I, it has quite a nice render. Uh, it's a very lively watch with a tourbillon. It's a, it also it's it's a watch that starts to have this kind of vintage RM feel yeah, to it. For sure. So it, uh, it it merges the, the best of both worlds, yeah. having a Richard Mille and also... It's extremely well. comfortable as well. And you're a young guy, so this watch fits you perfectly. Exactly. And we live in Switzerland, so I think even wearing this outside might be good. I mean, Geneva and Zurich different, but uh, yeah. Lausanne, uh, I don't think many people know about Richard Mille here. No, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a watch that's, that I like particularly because some elements of that watch are elements that, you know, as many people know, come from the concept watch at uh, Audemars Piguet. Yeah. The movement was made by APRP, no? Yeah, and it was it, it's actually the, the, the concept watch launched Richmond Mill in a way. Yeah. And in addition to being just a great watch, it also symbolizes for me uh, my youth. You know, I was born in 2000, so I grew up in the Richmond Mill era. Concept behind it is not so different from Hublot, so it's something that, you know, I, I, I hold close to my heart. I just love these watches. Some collectors tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> But because they don't have it, <laughs> I think but I, uh, many people hate on the brand, but I, I think anybody, if, if they could buy one or if they would make, let's say, more watches as well, they would immediately love to have one for sure. I'm wearing the PC Nick Felipe Piculic, which I just commissioned in September, it took about, I think, four or five months. Hand engraved dial, my logo as the seconds disc and a bit Very of clean. Cool. Thank right. you. I think it's something where uh, lots of brands uh, have a long way to go with using animations as like the second disc. Because the channel is, uh, you know, supports independence. Mm -hmm. It's, I think, good to support young guys because in the future you never know what they will come up with, you know. Definitely. Everybody, also a few of these guys on the table started with, you know, one watch and because you had these patrons at the beginning, now they build big brands, which we all love and adore. So I think it's important to, to nourish that basically for the future. So without further ado, let's jump into the watches. Which is the one you want to show us the first? So I think let, uh, let's start where it all started for me. So uh, for me, my first watch uh, is here on this table and it's uh, this Hublot, nice. uh, Sean Carter edition. One of my favorites, um, actually. Very cool watch. Uh, made, Hublot made a collaboration with uh, Jay-Z. Yeah. Very cool watch. At the time I was a, well, I'm still I'm a big hip hop fan. Yeah, uh, same here. I mean, Jay-Z is the man. I agree. <laughs> I love this watch. Uh, as, soon as, as soon as my father came back with the, the first designs he had and talking about how they were going to market the watch, uh, what they were going to do with him, um, completely fell in love. I was about 14 at that time. Yeah. And so for my, uh, for my 15th birthday, I got uh, this watch. Nice. And it was really the start of, uh, of my path into watchmaking, yeah. if I can say it that way. Of course, I had other watches before swatches yeah, or anything. Yeah, for but sure. Yeah. My first big proper watch was this Hublot, and uh, to this day, I still think it's super cool. They're very balanced. Uh, actually, people tend to see them as you know very chunky, or, yeah. but they sit very well on the wrist, and they have a, the bracelet with the you know the thickness, the mm -hmm. rubber, and everything is a bracelet that always feels very safe. Yeah. So next one, and staying in the family lineage, yeah. if we can put it that way is a watch that's very significant for me as it was the watch that uh, that I got for my graduation. Nice. And with the Hublot, I was I got into watches. I got used to wearing watches, appreciating them more. But my, you know, the the moment where my passion really sparked, where I, I suddenly felt a real connection to the watch and a watch that was not necessarily just, you know, the Hublot is very cool, but it's 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 a bit of fashion too. Yeah, you know, it's black, for sure. It's, yeah. a, it's a traditional watchmaking. Yeah, spirit. It's, it's, it's a, a bit different. Mm -hmm. 
But when I got this watch, uh, which is a vintage Blancpain uh, annual calendar, was just something different for me. Suddenly, I had a watch uh, in, in my hands that felt like a watch watch. Well, yeah, it was somewhat <laughs> of a way. proper watch. Yeah, uh, something that I had to look after, yeah. care for, um, which I didn't wear on any occasions, mm. only special occasions. And I think this where the journey really started for me. When you look at that watch, what was being made by Blancpain back in the days was just amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. when you see the engraving on the side of the case, uh, the, you have the hunter case back, yeah. hunter that's case cool. back with, you know, cool movement. That's a, so that's a limited edition of, uh, 250 pieces. Mm -hmm. And Blancpain never made a quartz watch. Yeah. That's the story. I remember that. Hopefully they never will. Yeah, me too. I don't know if they have actually. Have they? <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe the viewers can uh, uh, yeah can help us out on this Let one. Let us know in the comments so if they did. And yeah, and you know, size-wise, aesthetically, it's That's just perfect. Super pleasing watch. It's uh, I mean, it's quintessentially Swiss watch making, and it's yeah. uh, at its best. Nice white dial. No, for sure. And of course, for the family, a big uh, yeah, a, a very important brand as well, right? So talking about the family, you know, I think it's important to mention and. For me, it's a it's a it's a big part of my of my life, of my story. Um, so I grew up with a father that was very active in the watchmaking industry. Yeah, and uh, so I was too young to know the Blancpain era. But for me, it's as if I had lived it. You know, uh, my father recounting his stories, telling us about how he came up with what was initially a little startup and ended up being you know, <laughs> nice. one of the uh, one of the big boys around yeah. in the watch industry. Big acquisition by the Swatch Group, right? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know the, the you know the, the courage it took in the middle of the uh, the quartz crisis to say look we'll never make quartz yeah. watches we'll stick to mechanical uh, high end watchmaking. A very bold. I, I yeah <laughs> I wish I knew that period. I was older when Hublot came around. Yeah. So that I have very good memories of. But that watch, uh, in addition to being a cool watch, also symbolizes my father's yeah. journey, his for sure, his career, his courage and uh, where it all started for him. Beautiful. Which one do you want to go next? Well, look, uh, I think we're coming out of talking about Hublot, Blancpain, a bit more of the, like, those are those are two watches that have very high emotional value mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. But I think a good transition would be with this Patek Philippe, mm -hmm. reference 6000G. Beautiful. Uh, so Calatrava from uh, early 2000s. And that watch just, you know, for me, it's perfect. It's also very playful. As you can see, I, I put on this uh, strap. Uh, yeah. yeah, it works well. By it works uh, well. Davidoff Brothers. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't know, it has this feel to it. it it's a nice mix, I think, between vintage and modern. Huh? Exactly. Because it looks very like a modern young uh, dial. And, you know, you can say whatever you want about Patek Philippe. Uh, you know, we all have our different opinions mm -hmm. on, you know, how they're handling distribution at the moment. Yeah. Uh, their choices in aesthetics and colorways and whatever you want. But I think you cannot have a watch collection, a proper watch collection without having a Patek Philippe in it. So I need to get one. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, <laughs> they are, they are at the top of the, yeah. the pyramid in terms of watchmaking. Although lots of independent make, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, better finished watches or yeah. more interesting movements. So guys, tell me in the comments below, which Patek should I get? And don't say the Nautilus, please, because we all know that's impossible. <laughs> you, you, you should get, you, I think you should Something get a Grandmaster like Chime. Yes. With a salmon easy, dial. Easy, no problem. <laughs> we buy two, like, Thanks. you know. <laughs> well, apparently there's only one. Oh, damn it. <laughs> we can share, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's two, two faces in the watch. So. Exactly. So you wear one eye. We just exactly. you know, put the dials out. <laughs> so what else do we have here, Pierre? I mean, I, I've prepared, uh, like, I know what the, the watch that I want to present in terms of groups, like this little group, this group here. Mm -hmm. uh, right. One watch that stands out and is a bit alone is this Cartier, but uh, let's let's get right into it because uh, it has a cool uh, backstory to it too. So why did I choose to put this watch in uh, in this video? It's just that I love the aesthetics of Cartier. Yeah, They're fantastic and it really has a, an amazing feel to it. And so this watch has, let's say, nothing special in regards to... Limited edition, edition nothing, yeah. or anything. Just a regular Tonk American that uh, I bought off the website, so ordered it online, <laughs> which is nice. quite an interesting experience. You know, I've, I've not been used to uh, yeah. ordering watches online so often. The service was uh, impeccable, you know, got it through, <laughs> nice. got it through the mail. Uh, the Swiss mail is very good, by the way. <laughs> and they don't steal shit, so. No, usually not. Um, so I got the watch on a leather strap and, and I really wanted to have a very, very vintage feel to it. So mm -hmm. I got my friend Etienne from uh, Baltic and uh, sourced me this, this bracelet. And 
why I wanted to talk about this watch is just because even to, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a big collector, but to people that, uh, you know, you know, have some of the best watches in their hands mm -hmm. most of the time. I just love having a watch that has nothing special. That is just a cool watch, you know. Yeah. I just yeah. I wanted to have something. I wanted to have the. I wanted to have this feel, this aesthetic. I didn't care what year it came from. You know, I didn't yeah. look for the Cartier from the year with the original bracelet. I just wanted something that looked Not cool. No that CPCP, I was CP nothing. Yeah. Exactly. I was just happy with it. I just wanted something I could wear that I could feel comfortable with that I could uh, style with you know a nice suit no, or in jeans much, with, yeah. a, with a crew neck. Yeah. And this watch just does it for me. It's interesting value. It's it's rugged, you know. It's waterproof. It's yeah. fantastic and also elegant at the same time. It's also cool to have a watch and show a watch on the channel once that people can actually purchase. Exactly, you know. <laughs> it's, so it's a good. You know, thing. it's available. I ordered it a week later. I had it on the wrist, and then I got the bracelet. And oh, it looks very cool on the bracelet. You know, and. People that know me that know that I'm a bit into vintage, yeah. they might think it's a vintage yeah. watch. So they might the trick. So, yeah, as true. I say, fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw it from afar, I thought it was like a vintage Sintre. Yeah. But then I saw the thickness and the case. I'm like, yeah, it's an American. I think it's important to shine uh, the light on those kind of watches because today people can get very carried away. You know, I have so many friends, they get into watches and they're like, okay, I want a Rolex, I want a sub. Yeah. You know, the usual, usual stuff, suspects. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, they're not available. They can get them. You know, yeah. gray market prices are crazy. Uh, so it's nice also to shine the light on watches that mm -hmm. you viewers can actually or buy you know collectors or young uh, watch fans can just go out and buy. So maybe while we are on the Baltic topic, uh, yeah. what's this little guy here? So this little guy is their new uh, micro rotor that I got. I got the, from the first batch. So uh, no, serial number. 007. Oh, damn. <laughs> Mr. James Bond here. So I got the set with the three watches. Uh, I chose this one because uh, I really like the, the blue dial. Yeah. I started off by buying Baltic watches and then uh, got acquainted with the, the guys from Baltic, mm -hmm. uh, which are three amazing guys yeah. from Paris. Super, super nice, super cool. And, you know, they really had the, the courage to get into, you know, watches from, yeah. you know, not from another completely different business, from just being a uh, uh, watch, uh, watch lovers, and they they created something really amazing, really recognizable. I mean, the Baltic aesthetic are amazing. Yeah. They're set in a certain era that that for me is spot on what I like. And they have nice colors. They the price, the, the value for money is crazy. That's oh, great, and also uh, good aesthetic. Huh? Aesthetically, it's it's amazing. In a, in a world where you can wear less and less watches, mm -hmm. especially in Europe. I mean, I know from some friends out in Dubai or Singapore, it's a, yeah. it's a different story. But here in Europe, sometimes you, you have to be careful. Yes, for sure. And those are watches for, for collectors that, uh, that do the job. Mm -hmm. They have this vintage and cool looking style. Yeah. But at the same time, you can wear them on your wrist. You yeah. don't really and feel... And don't be afraid, you know, exactly. that somebody's going to attack you or anything. The watches I wear the most are, are, are Baltics. Yeah? Yeah. Nice. This one in particular, <laughs> uh, Double Crown, which was recently, recently yeah. released, also a great watch. I was around Europe this summer on the Mediterranean Sea. I only wore it. No. <laughs> nice. Easy, waterproof. Nice, nice, nice. No problems. And I agree with you. The aesthetics these guys made for this amount of money, I think, is spot on. For Shout sure. out to the Baltic boys. Shout out to the Baltic boys. <laughs> you, know, you know I love you. <laughs> and this was uh, the first batch was sold out very quickly. Yeah. And they opened up the second one uh, recently yeah. in, in January now. And also, I think for a few days, but I'm sure, yeah, they'll get so many orders. I mean, I love this watch as well. So, Pierre, aside from collecting, what do you spend your time most on lately? Or so, what's in the future for you? So, uh, lately I've been, uh, I've been involved in a few different uh, jobs here and there. But I'm really focusing now on working with my father. Uh, so, we're, we're currently working on an interesting project. Uh, hopefully it will see the, no. the light of day by the end of the year Damn. or maybe beginning of 2023. Um, and yes, yeah, so I've been learning a lot with him. He's kind of uh, teaching me the, the ropes of the, the business. trade. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, you know, so there's a special project coming, guys. You heard that? Huh? Special <laughs> project. Um, I can't really say more, unfortunately, about <laughs> it, but it, it, it should be good. And we're really trying to... Uh, bring the watch community and the watch industry uh, something cool. Okay, so make sure to follow him as well and more now. Uh. And other than that, uh, you know, I, I I try to take care of myself, yeah. do a bit of gym, you know, the usual <laughs> stuff. 
So moving on now with the uh, the Frank Miller there. What, what's the story behind that watch? So um, I guess I don't know if you you have so many of so many Frank Millers that appear. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, uh, this is the second time I think we had one with uh, or two with Supercar Blondie. So in her video, but this is yeah not often. So I decided to put the watch in this selection because as you can see, there are many different sides with the uh, approach of, of the way I see collecting. You know, some things are more sentimental, others are you know purely for the love of watchmaking. Others are aesthetic and to have fun. Um, but I also like to collect and to have watches that for me are sig historically significant. Mm -hmm. I mean, this watch in particular is maybe not historically significant, but I think Frank Mueller is. Yeah. Today, it's a brand that's sometimes overlooked. Uh, people underestimate the shock and the impulse it actually gave to the watch industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what I'm wearing on the wrist? Yeah. Some other watches on the table. This they, is what started it. They wouldn't exist them, without yeah. that. Yeah. They wouldn't exist without that brand. Frank Miller, you know, was a visionary. He came at a time where there were very few independents. Well, independents in the way we see it today. Mm -hmm. There were very few, you know, sports, modern. And I think it's, uh, I just like to have that watch because sometimes I wear it on the wrist. Nobody looks at it. Everybody's a bit <laughs> like, you know, uh, cool. You know, yeah. Whatever he's yeah. wearing. <laughs> but I know I'm wearing a watch that's actually shaped yeah. today's industry and they were the the first ones to do it that way in a sense yeah for sure for sure and many people think Richard Mill started the tonal shape yeah you know many modern collectors who come in the industry like uh, just recently think oh rm is tonal but no there was frank miller and even before we had uh yeah Bosch I mean, and all the, all the other vintage brands but frank course. miller for me really uh it's the the starting point of where we're at today maybe let's go to the other spectrum of independent watch collecting to a very elegant watch super rare i've seen this even just once before in my life on a bracelet from a friend a watch collector on instagram a shiny watch has crazy pieces what is this beautiful machine here so it's um Journe Tourbillon Souverain, the non-vertical one. It was one of the last Tourbillon Souverain they made, and they made a special edition with a cœur de ruby dial yeah. and a ruthenium subdials uh, made to 20 pieces, if I'm not mistaken. So you won't see much around. No. I mean, you <laughs> just have 18 more to yes, find. Yes, I need 18 um, more. <laughs> a spectacular piece. Journe aesthetics at, at, at their best. Yeah. Uh, you have all the traditional FP Journe codes, but with colors that just for me, they match, you know, with an, with, even with the black strap, mm -hmm. the bracelet is amazing. Yeah. Um, it just does it, you know, the red, well, let's say burgundy. Yeah, yeah pinkish almost. Pinkish, yeah. with a ruthenium dial, blue hands. I mean, the colors just fit. It, it looks super elegant on the wrist. It's it's a watch that, you know, it it's does a it very for nice me. watch collector's piece. Platinum you know. case, 40 millimeter. You know, I would, I have to say, I like 38 millimeter Jorns a bit more. Yeah, but this watch is fantastic, and we don't so often, as collectors or clients, we don't realize how hard making stone dials is. Oh, for sure. Because to work with you for know sure. to work with uh, the thickness that is required to fit in the case, uh, sometimes they crack. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's super complicated. So very often, probably yeah. to make twenty pieces uh, with that kind of dial is yeah. already somewhat of a. And all the screws go in the stone, basically, right? Exactly. So no, I mean they 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 probably messed up so many dials yeah. before they got the 20 right and uh you know it's typical journe and to me journe today is very important to acknowledge his impact on the independence yeah because oh, he sure. he is like the the general leading the army yes and uh his determination though he never gave up you know mm -hmm. since the, he started in 1999 stuck to his line kept his codes, his design aesthetics, you know, the philosophy in regards to how he wants to build his movement, how he wants to, to develop his movement. And kudos to him because it, it paid off. And today, you know, he's uh, reaping the the fruits of what's of his labor, huh? of his labor that took a long time, you know. Very nice. That's a that's a very good choice. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> but to to kind of leave the realm of unconventional-ish watches and yeah. a bit of storytelling and all that we're maybe going to enter in a more usual <laughs> yes. kind of topic so we're in the hype market right now <laughs> exactly you can see two brands uh, <laughs> Piguet, which are Rolex. very new huh? not many know these brands exactly. up and coming but you have to have a little of them you know 
Yeah, it um, depends. Huh? Technically, yeah. still. So. <laughs> so why don't we start off with uh, with Rolex with yeah. this uh, Daytona? So yeah, basically uh, from from far uh, a very basic looking Daytona, but in fact, if you dig deeper in into the the universe of this watch, you can see the bezel with a special marking hmm. where you can see the 225. Yeah. So commonly known in the market as the 225 bezels. Yeah. This one, uh, in addition to that, also has a white dial, four line dial, which probably is the rarest combination of all the 225 bezel hmm. watches. Wow. Uh, so at that time, Rolex, uh, used to make incremental changes to their watches. Mm -hmm. So from the R series, which was the porcelain Dell, the porcelain, as they call it in, <laughs> in the game. So coming from the R series to the L series, they always try to make, you know, small incremental changes, whether it be to the Dell. So you have the porcelain Dell, five liner, four liner, you have different series on the Daytona. It's really, really a nerdy aspect <laughs> of, a, of, yes. of Rolex watch connecting. <laughs> Um, which was the one that for me was the most aesthetically pleasing with the, the, the special bezel. What year is this watch? Uh, 1989. Yeah, nice. End of 1989. That looks in a pristine condition. Huh? Yeah, it's uh, unworn, uh, mm -hmm. found box and papers. Uh, I would have to check back now all the configurations that exist with the 225 bezel, but there are very few of them and it's uh, quite a hunt to find them. Oh, for sure. Especially full set and unscratched. Though. Exactly. And this watch has, in addition to being, you know, just super stylish. <laughs> <laughs> also a chameleon watch, a suit or jeans. Exactly. Works. In addition to being just a super cool, like, yeah. also everyday watch. Uh, it's a watch that merges both that, you know, tickles my... No, that's, that's not what I want to say. <laughs> tickles your what? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> and it, so it's a watch that merges kind of two worlds for me. Um, the first one being, well, it has all the traits of what I like in terms of vintage watch collecting. So you have to hunt, you have to mm -hmm. have the knowledge, you have to have the expertise, you have to know your stuff and, you know, really go out there, read a lot, you know, do your research mm -hmm. to, to find the, the, the right watches. But it also merges a bit more of a sentimental value. Uh, when I got finished high school, I left and went to work for Philips Watches in London mm -hmm. um, under a senior specialist, James Marks. And so I arrived there and he was my first boss. He was the one who taught me a lot, mm. taught me the tricks of the trade. And he's known to be uh, one of the very best scholars on uh, 16520s, Zenit Daytonas. Mm. And we've talked about this reference over and over and over and over again. Mm. And in addition to being something that I love, it also symbolizes for me the my relationship with him. And he's a bit of my master Yoda yeah. in a way. <laughs> I know he'll appreciate that comment. He's my um, he's my mentor. Uh, he taught me everything. He's a great friend, yeah. great man. And this watch has a lot of value to me. Yeah, beautiful. With my father's collection, we've managed to find all of the configurations of 225 bezels. Of course. So we have all of them <laughs> box and papers. Yeah. Also some that are without uh, box and papers just to wear yeah. you know, more wearable watches. And honestly, of all of them, the white dial is my favorite one because I remember spending days in the office looking at it with, uh, with James. We were under the loop, you know, zooming on the microscope. Is that the right serif from that period? <laughs> could, could that dial have been on that watch yeah. or, you know, of was course. it a dial swap? So we've we've really gone to uh, some lengths to uh, to actually buy that watch. Beautiful. And now it's here in the flesh. <laughs> Probably right. Hopefully right. <laughs> no, but I think this is uh, the the best type of watch. The one which isn't just you know expensive and you know price went up, but uh, the one which has a story. Yeah. Be and because you, when you wear it, it's it's more meaningful to you. And in fact, top, like. Price wise, it was interesting because the, the time we bought them, some people were, you know, we, we were making deals quite easily. Mm -hmm. We were going to dealers saying, look, uh, what do you want for them? They yeah. were telling X, we said, okay. What was the price back in the day? Uh, oh. It was around, you know, 30,000 mark. Yeah. That's fine, huh? Yeah. Today, what do you Depending think? On, well, today it's... Uh, Anybody's guess, huh? Well, I've had, some... I've had offers. Yeah. And it's, to say the least, it doubled or tripled maybe. Yeah, for sure. Price. Yeah. 
But at the time, you know, people were saying, well, you know, what are they doing? They're yeah. just going around buying those watches, uh, you know, no, discount, <laughs> no questions asked. And, and you were sweeping just, them We just them. wanted them because we loved them. And finally, it wasn't such a bad, uh, bad idea to, to go out chasing. Especially on the vintage. For us, it's condition, condition, condition. Yeah. So I tend to buy more modern watches um, for my father's collection, which uh, I manage mm-hmm. entirely. I tried to go more for no pressure. No pressure. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I can handle it. But uh, for his collection, you know, we tried to go quality, quality, yeah. quality condition, yeah. and uh, something that I was taught that is essential in buying vintage watches. Yeah. Don't buy the price. Buy the watch. Yes. Even if you pay a bit more. Even if you pay a bit it's more, be because, worth it. You know, line, yeah. Do your research look at condition, talk to people, you know, lots of people in this industry are very accessible, very yeah. friendly. They love to give their advice. They love to give their help. And in, in vintage, you can, it, the experience, I know people who've had really bad experiences, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, but if you, if you do it well, it's just fun. It's hunting. And it feels very good when you finally get that grail <laughs> watch. You know, we've searched for that watch for that's nine true. months. That's true. And you know, you've, you're looking for it nine months, looking for uh, <laughs> is there a wild Dell out there? And once you find it, you know, it's all the questions, all the research. It's amazing. It's here. And it's nice to see it here. But after so much work, uh, it's exactly. awesome. Man. Now moving on to another Rolex, which uh, you were searching for a long time as well. Yeah, <laughs> not that long. <laughs> But <laughs> just waited long. <laughs> yeah, in this case, it's it's not the usual suspect. It's just stupidly obvious watch. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, leave a comment if you know the model. <laughs> <laughs> but I have something interesting to say about it, and okay. that's why I chose to, to put it today. Perfect. It's hype. Yeah. It's too much for me. Definitely. <laughs> but how amazing is that watch? Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> and coming from a place where Rolex actually. Because lots of people criticize kind of Rolex's, let's say, creativity, their innovation. But through the, the 50s, through the year 2000, and even onwards, all their like life, in a way, they have been trying to make incremental changes to make you know, the watches better, the no. dials better, the dials more readable, to make them more accurate, to make them more waterproof. I mean, just look at the, you know, we are talking about Daytona, but look at the submariner or sea dweller, yeah. uh, you know, the lineage. There are like, I don't know how many references, no. uh, you know, small differences on the dials, on the bezels, on the, the bracelets, case size, yeah. the case size. You know, they've always tried to go forth and make things right. Yeah. And although now today you can find uh, the GMTs on both Oyster bracelets and Jubilee bracelets, uh, that one is from 2018. So at the time you could only get it on that bracelet. Which I prefer. And what I love is that if you look at the history of the GMT, you know, with the Pan Am and, you know, the colorway, mm-hmm. the blue and the red, uh, the pilot's watch. That whole history is linked to an era where, you know, flying planes is not like today. You know, you don't, yeah. it's not easy jet. It was a time where, you know, <laughs> flying planes was still a bit dangerous. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> where, you know, pilots were kind of heroes and yeah. they lived in a world where, you know, taking planes at the time had this kind of luxurious mm-hmm. feel to it. It was exclusive. Not everybody could fly a plane. No, of course. And for me, that watch belongs because of its history on the Jubilee bracelet. Yeah. And I think that it's amazing to see how Rolex evolved from the original uh, GMT to having this watch today that is just perfect in size, perfect in feel, perfect in wearability, in use, and read- readability also. Oh, of course. And to have that bracelet on there, for me, is Rolex showcasing you know, how smart and how accurate their own decisions they make. Mm-hmm. So although it's obvious, it's still an amazing watch. Yeah, for sure. And now we go to another brand which is uh, being really hyped up since the last two, three years. It was always, you know, on a good level, but even more this year. Even more this year. They have a 50th anniversary. Exactly. So we have a very cool. And uh, brand it's, here. it's also nice to finish by that brand because it's um, it's a brand I hold very high regards. It's a brand I love personally. I think they have an amazing history. They have amazing watches. They have. For me, in the debate of steel sports watches, I am, no. and I have no shame in saying it, Team Royal Oak. Yeah. <laughs> it's the original one. It's, 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 in French, you say brut. It's uh, raw. Huh? Or yeah, it's raw. Uh, it's raw. It okay. just has everything of a, of a real proper watch for me. Manly watch. <laughs> um, 
Also so, yeah. for ladies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't get any hate comments. <laughs> no, but especially for ladies, I think, you know, but the raw look, I think it's very classy and it looks very well, very good on, on, on women as well. And they make very nice iterations. Sometimes even nicer. <laughs> yeah, sometimes nicer. No, really. Yes, I agree. <laughs> And so this watch, in, in addition to being a Rolex, which I love, it's also a perpetual calendar, yeah. which I love as well. Many people don't know that, but since taking over my father's collection and managing it, I've uh, tried to build a collection around the AP, mm -hmm. uh, and in particular AP perpetual calendars, whether they be Rolex or not. Although I tend, you know, to mm -hmm. to find nice uh, perpetual calendar Rolex, and this one was was one of the first watches uh, I decided to buy, less for the condition. Less for the rarity, no. but just because of the style. I mean, just a boss watch and not necessarily yeah. the obvious uh, perpetual calendars. It, it could be a bit tacky, yeah. but at the same time, it, 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 it makes it cool. And that's also what vintage is about. So this is a watch that really uh, has the effect of teleportation. Yeah, You know, sometimes uh, if I wear it, I find myself dreaming of cruising in the 70s with yeah, a... It's, it's badass. Huh? With a two-tone <laughs> steel and yellow gold watch, you know. <laughs> Inside, inside a nice Italian red car. Yes. <laughs> nice suit, nice cigar. I don't know if uh, your viewers know, but uh, the, the the best watch collecting and most of the best watches come out of Italy because Italians were were the first to be really into watches, especially Old Marpigan and especially Royal Oak. Yeah. So, you know, you can imagine wearing that in a nice wine yard in Tuscany. For sure, for sure. Or by the pool somewhere in Italy, so that's no, beautiful. And then the last watch on the table here is also something which uh, many of you know already. So you, this watch. Why did you decide to get this one, for example? That is a watch that you know it's 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 steel. Uh, the dial renders in 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 person amazing. Mm. You know, the, it's, it's fantastic when you have nice light on it. The white is, you know just pops off. The the blue is nice, and for me, it's just a watch that they managed to to do perfectly. Yeah. It's 38 millimeters, but overall great watch. And that's probably, you know, watch you can see by the condition of it, but yeah, you wear it a lot. I've huh? worn it. I've loved it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a great reference. And once again, you know, why you, why I love AP is look, you know, you have two watches, two ears, two different complications but you have one thread and yeah one design language is the same huh? yeah one similar feel to yeah. them you know it's there's something that is just uh, eternal with the rollock you own a lot of uh, different brands and also cases and complications and for somebody who has basically been in watchmaking since you were born probably what is your grail or do you have this do you have a grail watch or do you don't believe in a concept or is it hard to choose one it's hard to choose one yeah. uh, because, well, at least that's the way I see collecting mm -hmm. personally. It doesn't, you know, that that's just engage. Uh, it's just, of course, yeah. my vision. But for me, what I love overall is to have watches that make me dream. Mm -hmm. You know, watches that bring me, you know, out of my daily life, bring me out of just, you know, 2022 or whatever time and year we're living, yeah. but that can really transport you to another period and another vibe and I think most of the watches here uh, do that perfectly and even when you're in a, you know if you're going to work if you're going to the gym or whatever if you have a watch on even even if it accompanies you in your daily life it every time you look at a watch I want to feel something and I want to uh, yeah I want to be transported into another another world and I think my passion for watches uh, comes from the fact that watches have the ability to do that of course cars can you yeah. know, art can, um, traveling, and you have so many, so many different things that can do the same effect. But the fact that watches are so close to your skin, they're on your wrist, they're, you know, close to your veins. Yeah, basically, yeah. It's something that it feels very close, and so I couldn't say I have one grill in particular, yeah. but, uh, you know, it's also, it's also in con constant evolution. Yeah, your, your so taste change, your design. Your taste changes, your, yeah, your, the, the market changes, because let's not forget one thing, and I, you know, I would be a hypocrite if I, uh, if I said otherwise, but obviously the market has trends, mm. and according to those trends, you perceive collecting differently. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's, uh, I recently 
tended to start being attracted by modern watches mm -hmm. a bit more than I was maybe two years ago, where I was only, you know, full vintage. And that's probably more because of the wearability. Yeah. Uh, and Every because, day user. And because brands, I feel sometimes, you know, they, they've seen their vintage markets act mm -hmm. or react in a certain way. So I think the, the industry now is really interesting because you it's like having a bit of a war, you know, you see auction yeah. catalogs at Philips that are just, you know, incredible. Yeah. And at the same time, you have people releasing incredible watches. So it's kind of... Yeah. Where to put your money yeah, sometimes. And they're kind of uh, colliding sometimes, yeah. you know, fighting in a way one against yeah. the other. But sometimes also collaborating. Yeah, but it's a good dynamic. It's yeah. a good dynamic. I think the market is heading towards a interesting space. A segment of the market that wasn't necessarily exploited before is now with the vintage and let's say the gray market. Mm -hmm. Overall, it's an interesting and fun time to, oh, for sure. to live in the watch industry at this moment. For sure. This is an awesome, Pierre. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking your time and of course. Uh, giving me the opportunity to display a few watches. My pleasure. I hope you like them. Oh, hope the selection was nice. Hope the viewers would like them. <laughs> Let us know which uh, which was your favorite model, or maybe what do you think uh, Pierre should add to his collection. Also, if you don't follow him yet, check out his Instagram account. I don't. I post rarely, but thank you. <laughs> but when he does, it's good. <laughs> so definitely keep an eye on for that. Plus the project you were talking about, uh, you know, keep a close eye on that when it's happening. I'm super curious <laughs> what it's gonna be. Um, and that's it, uh, guys. Leave a like, subscribe, share this with somebody who likes watches as much as you do. And, Pierre, and, yeah. and don't forget to subscribe because maybe next time <laughs> we'll have another guest in, somebody uh, I know very well and maybe we'll be uh, able to talk about this project a bit. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Fingers crossed. Eh? A bit more in details. <laughs> that would be awesome to, to share your new project and love for watchmaking or whatever it's going to be on this channel. Guys, leave a like, subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.